for joining us today. You have got Michael Screw and the Yarn Inspirations team, including Julia, who is going to be walking us through a beautiful party hardy mosaic knit baby blanket today. I think we still have a few joining in, but again, thank you guys for joining us. We're so excited to walk you through this baby blanket today with Julia from Yarn Inspirations. Um, we are going to be recording this class, so if you guys get stuck, if you have any trouble, if you want to rewatch it, no worries at all. This will be fully recorded and on michaels.com tomorrow. We'll be sure to post the link for you in chat. We're also going to post the pattern in the chat, so be sure to check it out. Um, we want to know what questions you have. That's what we're here for. So make sure to put them in the chat. Keep asking. Um, but otherwise, I want to turn it over to Julia and, and take us through this beautiful project today. Hi. <laughs> Hope everyone's doing well. Um, I think this is a really fun technique, mosaic knitting. If you haven't tried it before, um, you don't have to commit to the blanket we're posting. I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, the technique in general. So but I absolutely download the pattern, take a look at it. It is what I'm going to use to walk you through a swatch. I've got my little swatch right here. See the hearts. So I would say don't be intimidated if you're a beginner because this is actually a really great introduction to knitting with multiple colors. I know that other um, color work techniques can be really intimidating, feral knitting, intarsia knitting, all you need to know to work mosaic knitting techniques is the knit stitch. I guess you need to you need to be able to cast on and off as well, but you need to know how to knit stitch, how to slip a stitch, and basically how to change colors, how to knit stripes. It's all based on two row stripes. Um, so it's pretty simple stuff. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the name mosaic. Like, why is this called mosaic knitting? There's a woman who is very well known in the knitting community for writing fantastic stitch dictionaries, stitch libraries, and she wrote this book. I have this ancient copy. Um, is that backwards for you guys? It probably is. It says Mosaic Knitting, and it's by Barbara G. Walker. It is backwards for you, right? No, it's it's front okay, facing. <laughs> okay, it's flipped. Okay, great. <laughs> you can read this. <laughs> I was lucky enough, this is like an old discarded library book that I found at a, uh, a yard sale. So if you're interested in this technique, um, I suggest checking out this book because it's got tons and tons of different patterns to see. You can totally tell it's from the 70s. <laughs> but anyway, the term mosaic knitting was coined by her, but really all it is is slip stitch color work. Um, and mosaic, I guess she took that because it kind of looks like tiles. All of the patterns really have this kind of pixelated look. Um, so it, it is somewhat recognizable, but it's incredibly flexible considering how easy it is. So um, it can also be worked, we're working in garter stitch, which is knit every row. Um, but this technique also works in stocking stitch, which is going to affect your tension. Let's not even go into detail about that today. I just want to mention it as an aside, if anyone asks. Um, most of the time it's used uh, in garter stitch, which is knit every row. And that makes for a really great fabric that um, doesn't curl, so you don't have to worry about the edges too much. And it's not reversible, but it does have a pretty nice wrong side. So here's the right side. And here's the wrong side. It's not, you can't see the hearts, but it's not, um, it's not a big mess of floats. Floats are what we call when you work in um, feral knitting and you have to carry the color across and you end up, the back ends up with all of these strands which isn't ideal for a baby blanket or something you're going to put a baby in because their little fingers can get stuck and we don't want that. So that's another bonus. We had a question come through, Julia, um, on if you have to use circulars on this project or not. Um, good question. Um, the technique does not require um, circulars, but the pattern quotes circular needles because you have so many stitches that you have to accommodate they're probably not going to fit on a straight needle if you have a very long straight needle 
you might be able to do it, but it, all the stitches are going to get bunched up. It's going to get really heavy. So it's um, a lot easier to knit um, on a circular needle. I'm going to be using circular needles to knit my swatch just because I really prefer them. Um, but if you're going to knit along with me today and work a swatch, we're only doing a couple of, uh, a few stitches, a small section of the pattern. So you can absolutely use straight needles. Um, there's also another question about, um, on mosaic, would you ever recommend lining the back of the blanket with fabric? Sure. I mean, you could do that with, with any blanket. If the, if the, 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 this isn't appealing to you, then absolutely. You know, I think I, um, I think that also gives a blanket a bit of stability. I know that I knit, um, a garter stitch blanket for my daughter and garter stitch is quite stretchy and I wanted that blanket to be a little more stable. So yeah, so, so a, um, so a fabric backing, if you like, I would just suggest maybe hand stitching it because if you machine stitch, that seems going to be really rigid and it's not going to allow the knitting to stretch. So yeah. Awesome. Um, Shall I move on? I don't want to, I, I have a lot to talk about. I don't want to do too much yeah. talking with just looking at my face because I know you probably want to get in there and get into knitting. So how about, oh, here we go. Thank you. I'm going to roll my, roll my chair over here a bit. So here's my swatch and here's what you need if you're going to swatch along with me today. You need two colors of yarn. Today we're using Bernat Baby Velvet, which is a chenille yarn. It's super duper soft, comes in lots of great colors. Um, and I'm using, I think we're gonna put that in the chat, um, the colors in this swatch. The aqua is called Bleached Aqua and Restful Rose is the other color, the peachy pinky color. And something to note, if, you, if you're working in this technique, you really want two colors that contrast nicely because then you're not gonna be able to see the pattern evolve and it will just kind of blend in. So for instance, I've got like, what is this cuddly cloud and this light gray. I mean, that's just not gonna work. In a pinch, if you're just following along for the sake of learning the technique, by all means, use what you've got on hand. I know we're all making do. Um, but I'm lucky enough, I work for a yarn company and I have this stuff on hand. <laughs> and like I said, uh, I'm using circular needles. You do not need to use circular needles for the swatch. But if you want to make the baby blanket that is linked in the chat, you're casting on a lot of stitches. It's 134 stitches. So um, you need the circular needle to accommodate all of those stitches. Okay. So I'm going to be referencing the chart. So you're going to need your needles. You're going to need your two colors of yarn, um, some scissors, stitch markers, helpful, um, and the chart. Now, if we're, you're just making a swatch with me, you don't have a printer at home, what have you, don't worry about it too much. I'll be talking you through stitch by stitch. Um, but you, if you do have another screen you can pull it up on or um, you can print it, that would be great because this is just what I'm going to reference as an example of a mosaic knitting pattern. Um, so let me talk about charts unless there's any other burning questions right now. Um, we did just have a question. I'm assuming they're trying to get prepped up um, hmm. on how many stitches did you cast on for your swatch? Um, this swatch you see here is the full width of the chart. So um, I'm not going to work that for our, our um, swatch today because it's, it's too big. Um, for today, I'm going to suggest casting on 26 stitches. Great. Um, this was an extra 16, uh, whatever that is. And um, we're not going to worry about increases and decreases right now. In the pattern, like I said, it's only knit stitches and slip stitches. But in the blanket pattern, if you go through this, the uh, swatch with me today and then you go to 
a cast on blanket, I really hope you do, <laughs> you'll notice that you cast on, you need a few rows, there's an increased row, and then you start working your mosaic pattern. There's a reason for this. The slip stitches that I talked about kind of draw in the fabric a little bit. It pulls it in um, horizontally. So if you have a garter stitch border and then you start working in this other stitch, it's got a different stitch gauge. So it's going to pull in and you're going to get a wavy border. So the pattern even says here gauges. It gives you two gauges. It says 15 stitches in garter stitch. 17 and a half stitches in the mosaic stitch. So, so that's why you have an increase row there to make sure that you're, when you switch stitch patterns, that your blanket lies nice and flat. I just want to mention that, but we're not going to worry about the increases and decreases for our swatch. We're just going to get to the, the fun mosaic part. Okay, so for the chart, this might look scary. Don't be intimidated because this is actually more simple than it looks. We're only ever working with one color at a time. This is what makes mosaic very different than um, feral knitting because in one row, even though you have what appears to be two colors in each row, you're only working with one color for rows one and two and the next color for rows uh, three and four, and on and on and on. It's essentially two row stripes, really simple. This, where you see the colors intersect in the same row, those are your slip stitches. So, and let me, before I get too deep, talk a little bit about charts in general, if you don't use a chart. So if you have downloaded our pattern, which is called the Burnett Party Hardy <laughs> Mosaic Knit Baby Blanket. The link's in the chat. Um, you'll notice that there's several pages that we have the words for you, all the text, if you prefer to do it that way, if you prefer to read the words, and then we have the chart. I find, especially for doing demos, it's much easier to refer to the chart because it's a visual representation. So, if you're unfamiliar with knit charts, there are some standards and things that you're going to find similar no matter what technique you're using, no matter um, what colors you're using, um, it's going to be the same. Even among uh, different manufacturers, different designers, there's some relative industry standards. And what those are, are you always read the chart from bottom to top. So luckily, we've got our numbers here. You don't really have to remember that. You just have to remember to follow the numbers. The numbers start at one at the bottom and go up. The other thing to remember is that when you're working a right side row, you're working from right to left. When you're working a wrong side row, you're reading the chart from left to right. So if that seems a little confusing, think about the way that you knit. When you're knitting, you're going, from right to left, right? And then you turn your work and you're still knitting from right to left on your needle, but the chart is actually representing what you see on the right side of the work. So that's why it flips each time. It's because this is a representation of what's facing you. It's on the right side of the work. So bottom to top, left to right, nope, sorry, right to left <laughs> on your right side rows left to right on the wrong side rows. Just follow the numbers and you'll be fine. Um, the two different colors represent your two different colors of yarn. That's pretty straightforward. So assign which one you want. Um, I'm going to be using for the gray, I'm, I'm going to be using the pink shade. And then for the white, I'm going to be using the bleached aqua shade. Um, and what else can I tell you about charts in general? Oh, sticky notes. These are a chart's best friend. Now, I'm cheating a little here because I, I printed out this giant chart. Your chart probably looks more like this. <laughs> so I like to move up a sticky note 
let's say I've done two rows and I put it there and then I move it up each row as I'm going to keep my place. I use a sticky note because you can move it and because if I make a mistake and I have to go back I can I can bring it back again. A temporary marker. You, of course you can use a highlighter, you can cross things off with a pe uh, pencil, whatever works for you. All right, so now the symbols. Each square in our chart represents one stitch. That's another universal chart thing to remember. The color we talked about. So assign a color to each um, shade on the chart. And then there's symbols within these, right? This entire thing is garter stitch, which is knit stitches and slip stitches. But you'll notice that there are a couple different symbols here, even though we're only working knit stitches. So a plain box with nothing in it, just a square, is a knit stitch on the right side. So if th this is a right side row, row one, I see nothing in that box, it is a knit stitch. Row two, when I'm working the wrong side, there's a little dash here. This symbol is the universal, relatively universal symbol for a purl stitch. But because this chart represents what you're seeing on the right side of your work, it's actually a knit stitch when you're working your row. I know that sounds confusing if you're new to this kind of thing, but a knit stitch looks like a knit stitch on the, on the front of your work, looks like a purl stitch on the back of your work. So depending what's facing you, the knit stitch looks like a knit or it looks like a purl. I know that that's something that can very much trip up a beginner. So if you're trying out this technique for the first time, if you're a beginner, if this confuses you, just know that any stitch on this chart that doesn't look like this V is a knit stitch. No matter what side is facing you, you're just working a knit stitch. So normally I wouldn't say ignore what's written in the, in the chart, but for this case, let's keep it simple. Just know that anything that doesn't has, have this V is a knit stitch, just knit. So then the second symbol we're dealing with here is this V. This means to slip a stitch. So I'll, I'll go over that in detail when I start my swatch. So that's, you're moving it from the left-hand needle to the right-hand needle, and you're not knitting it at all. You're just slipping it over. You're slipping it purl-wise. Again, I'll demo that when we start swatching. And you're gonna always hold the yarn to the back of your work. Again, I'll go over that again. But just talking about the symbol, that means slip stitch, Everything else on this chart is just a knit stitch. And you'll see this V, it, um, it moves over two rows. There could be, a, uh, maybe some people do their charts a little differently. There might be a V on each, in each one of those boxes, but essentially you're not knitting that stitch, you're slipping it um, on both of these rows. So if that V is touching any part of your, the box that you're on, the stitch that you're on, it's a slip stitch. So the only thing you have to pay attention to really is the color of the box and then know that you're knitting or if it's got that V in it, you're slipping. So I hope that makes sense while I'm not knitting and I'm just pointing at squares. So I'm going to go ahead and cast on if you're following along with me, what did I say? I'm going to do 26 stitches, which is one repeat, one 16 stitch repeat of our pattern, plus five stitches on either row, um, on either side of that repeat, just to make a nice edge. So if you want to pick up your needles and cast on 26 stitches, then um, I can take some questions if anyone has any. Awesome. Um, everyone, just if you have any questions right now, feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll make sure that we get them over to, to Julia. And, okay, well, I'll just keep talking. 
Charlie uh, has a question. Um, mm -hmm. In this first row, so if you were referencing your existing swatch. So is the V supposed to be the blue yarn while the knit stitch is the pink yarn? Um, I think this will be more clear as I move on. Awesome. If you look at this, you're only ever working with one color in one row. So for row one, this is going to be my, my pink. Um, I'm knitting five stitches, slipping two stitches, knitting four stitches, slipping one. So the color of this is kind of irrelevant as you're knitting. It's just going to appear the opposite color once you've knit the, the rows that are following. This, I think this will make more sense as we go on. <laughs> I'm sorry if I wasn't too clear, but- um, No, she said, okay, thanks. This will be great. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> yeah, so it's just slip whatever you see. Slip whatever is next on your needle. Don't worry about the color. And the nice thing with having these edge stitches here, whatever color you're starting with in the very first box, that's what you use for the entire row. So you can see that row one is, um, what did I say? That's gonna be my pink. So I'm gonna be pink, pink, blue, blue, pink, pink, blue, blue. Don't worry about changing colors here because we don't have to do it. We're just slipping stitches. It's essentially just two row stripes with some slip stitches thrown in. And I'm casting on, I'm using a long tail cast on. Um, I wouldn't worry about what technique you use to cast on for this. Just use whatever you like, whatever you know. Let's see, two, four. I know counting on camera is always so fascinating. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, one, two, three, four, five, six. And just to repeat, you don't need to use a circular needle for this for the swatch. You would need it for the blanket to accommodate all the stitches. I'm just using circular needles because honestly if I can I will use circular needles for everything because I just find them much more comfortable. Um, and I'm going to suggest knitting two rows before we start into the pattern. That's just to give us a little something to, um, to work with so that you're not, I don't have to demo with just my little wimpy cast on there. Give it some guts. Oh, let me, let me maybe try to stay in frame, that could help. <laughs> so hopefully, maybe as I'm doing this, if you're an absolute beginner or maybe you haven't knit in a while, the knit stitch. Let me get my things out of frame here. Okay, the knit stitch. There we go. All, all I'm doing is taking my right hand needle, bringing it from left to right into the front loop of the next stitch on my left needle, wrapping around a yarn, pulling the loop through, pulling that off the left hand needle. And that's the stitch that pretty much everyone learns first. I don't know anyone who's learned how to purl first. That would be interesting. And hopefully you can follow along. I'm a right-handed knitter or an English style knitter. Continental's a little different, but it shouldn't make any difference to our technique today. Mosaic knitting. Awesome. Um, so we had a couple questions about um, some beginners here about casting on. So I just wanted to let everyone know I'm going to drop a YouTube link here in the comments um, or in the chat that you can, um, that video will be very helpful to you if you're, you're a very beginner and you need help with the cast on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very helpful. The cast on, um, I used, you know, I don't actually, if I'm teaching someone how to knit, um, a, a real beginner, I usually suggest the 
uh, knitted cast on. I think sometimes it's called the cable cast on because the technique you use to cast on when you do that is essentially the same motion you use when you knit. So I, I'm not sure what you linked. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not <laughs> contradicting what you put up there, but you know what, whatever way you can get your loops, your yarn on your needles today will work for our purposes. And just a reminder to everybody, um, if we're going too fast or if you need a refresher, that this video recording will be available tomorrow. So you can watch it, repeat, slow it down. Um, it will just be available to rewatch at your leisure. Yes. Thank you. So I'm going to start looking at my chart now. So if you do have the chart printed out, what I did because we just have 26 stitches and this is more than that. We're, we're going all the way here to the end of where it says 16 stitch rep and there's this little box outlining here. This is where we're gonna stop and then we're gonna jump to the plain part at the end here where it's just five stitches. So to make things a little easier for myself to follow along, all I did was I folded that over. So now you should have 16 stitches here. And I wanted to show you how I folded it, <laughs> which is why I didn't take this in advance. So you get to watch me break out the scotch tape here. Another handy, handy tool for knitters. All right, and now we're finally gonna get to it. I'm sorry, thanks for your patience, all that blathering, and now we get to the knitting. I'm gonna get my second color ready. So it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna I'm gonna call my my gray boxes here my pink color, and the white boxes my aqua color. Um, it doesn't matter what one you start with as long as you're consistent. Um, I I start now. My border is gonna be the peachy color. So. We're starting at the bottom, we're going right to left. The first five boxes are just knit stitches. So I'm gonna knit five. Then we get to where the action happens. Okay, so exciting. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to slip the next two stitches. That's what these V's mean. And I'm always going to slip purlwise. So what's that mean? That means I'm going to insert my needle instead of from the left to right into the next stitch. I'm trying to get a good angle so that you can see. How about like that? There we go. Um, I'm going to insert as if I'm going to purl the next stitch from the right to the left. So that's the difference between slipping knitwise, slipping purlwise. Slipping knitwise would be like this. Slipping purlwise is like that. And I'm keeping my yarn at the back, my working yarn. So even though I'm slipping purlwise, I'm not bringing the yarn to the front. That's what you do if you were actually purling the next stitch. I'm just slipping it. So I'm slipping purlwise one stitch, slipping purlwise second stitch. Then there's four knit stitches. So your yarn is at the back in this row the whole time. Three, four, slip one, knit one, slip one. Slip your next stitch purlwise, keep the yarn at the back, knit the next stitch, slip it purlwise. Then I've got another one, two, three, four knit stitches. And I'm slipping two stitches with my yarn at the back of the work. And then I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Hopefully you've got six stitches at the end of your row. That's when you know that you've made a mistake in your pattern and you have to go back and I hate that, but it's easy to find out in this technique to figure out 
if you've miscounted somewhere because you're gonna see it pretty quickly. Now, right now you see no pattern at all because we haven't switched colors. It, once you, it takes, you know, switching colors maybe two or three times before the pattern really starts to emerge. So especially at this point, um, it can be confusing to recognize the front and the back of your work because we're working in garter stitch. And if you're not marking off every row or you put it down, your kid walks in, wants a snack, whatever. <laughs> I like to mark the front of my work with one of these removable stitch markers. I love these little guys so much. These are um, Clover um, removable stitch markers. They're definitely available at Michael's because that's where I got these. And I'm just gonna like stick the marker anywhere so that I know when the marker's facing me, I'm on a right side row. And now's the time if you wanna mark the place on your chart to put a little sticky note there, highlighter, check it off, what have you. We've done our first row. Uh, Julia, we had a question here about how did you print the chart bigger? <laughs> oh, you know what? It, I Because I have access to the PDF files and I have a graphic design background that I probably did it a way that um, you at home might not be able to do that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> But most, um, it is a PDF and most printers, most computers will give you the option of um, zooming in. And now that are printing it at like, I think this is 200% and I did cut off the key. Um, so play around when you hit print uh, on your computers, when the dialog box comes up, you prob there's probably an option to print it larger. It's usually just an automatic 100%, but look around and play around with that. I know it's so nice, like, you know, when we, we lay out these patterns, we like to try to keep things on one page. But I know some of these charts, especially this, because it's 44 rows, it get, can get real tiny. I think every knitter or crocheter would prefer to have like, <laughs> giant charts like this all the time. So here's another great thing about mosaic knitting. The return row, every wrong side row, you really don't have to pay much attention because it's basically exactly the same as the row you worked before. Now right now, because I don't have two colors, I can't, I can't automatically see where the slip stitch is. It's a little, once you get established, it'll be easier, but you're just knitting the same stitches that you knit the row before and slipping the same stitches you slipped the row before. But I'm going to be careful as I'm establishing my pattern with the second row um, to count everything because it's more difficult to read your knitting. And I have to make sure I'm going from left to right when I'm on my wrong side rows. And the number two is over here. So I know this is where I start. On right side rows, you start over here. So I'm going to start with six. And I mentioned before that this is a pearl symbol um, with a little dash here but we're gonna knit it. If you look at the key, it will tell you knit on wrong side rows when you see that dash. And we're on a wrong side row, so we're still gonna knit it, even though if you've worked from um, other charts, you might recognize that as a pearl. So we can just ignore those little dashes for this chart. If you're a beginner, if it's confusing, every stitch that's not slipped is a knit. So I'm going to knit six. I don't know if it's hot where you are, but it is hot where I am and my air conditioning vent is at my feet and my hands are sweating. <laughs> if I could knit um, my feet, I'd be perfect. <laughs> uh, we did have a question here on um, how, to, how do you know which side is your right side and which side is the wrong side? I think it's important to establish that at, right from your first row and add that marker that I talked about. Because especially if you're a beginner, it's gonna be difficult to read your knitting. I think learning how to read your knitting and recognize what the stitches look like on your needles is something that just comes with experience. And once you get several rows in and things start to look like this, it's gonna be pretty obvious that this is the right side and the wrong side. And once we get a few more rows, you'll be able to see that. 
but I just highly recommend um, putting that marker on your first row. Oh, but you know what? You might be asking me, how do you know that's the row? Okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. In the written instructions, um, it says first to five rows knit, sixth row wrong side, yada, yada, yada. First row in brackets, RS or right side. It's always going to be indicated, at least in um, the Your Inspirations patterns. This is the way we do it. We will indicate somewhere in the written instructions that um, which is the right side and which is the wrong side. And then once you mark that and establish that, um, then, then you're, you know, it's gravy. You just have to be able to recognize the right and the wrong side. But we will establish it somewhere in the pattern. And in general, usually your first row is the right side. And that's not, you know, a hard and fast rule for every single pattern. But most patterns, your first row is the right side. Your second row is the wrong side. I hope that clears that up. Um, okay, so I'm going to work the second row so that we can get a few more rows knit during this class and you can get to see the pattern emerge, which is the fun part. So row two knit six, slip two stitches. So on wrong side rows, the slips are going to be a little bit different. I'm going to slip purlwise, the same way I did before, except I'm bringing the yarn to the front. And that's because I'm slipping with the yarn to the wrong side of the work. And the wrong side of the work is facing me right now. So that's why it's at the front. I'm going to slip a purlwise. I still have to slip another one, purlwise, and then I'm going to bring my yarn to the back again to knit my next stitch. So the yarn is always carried when you're slipping. You're the working yarn should always be at the back of the work. So you have to be careful that when you're on your wrong side row, the back of the work is facing you, so the yarn should be in the front. And when you're on your right side row, the right side is facing you, and your yarn should be at the back. And you can, it's hard to see with just the one color, but that's the yarn in front of the stitches that I'm slipping. And that's, that's why it looks like this on the back, because all those stitches that have been slipped have a little tiny strand of yarn across them. And that's why the pattern's not visible on um, the wrong side. So I've slipped two, and then I knit four, two, Four, slip one, knit one, slip one. So again, I'm bringing my yarn to the front, slipping purlwise, bringing the yarn to the back, knit one, bring the yarn to the front, which is the wrong side of the work, slip the next stitch purlwise without knitting it, bring the yarn to the back so that I can knit my stitches and it's four knit stitches here. I hope I'm not going too fast. Then I'm going to slip two stitches and knit five. So I'm on the wrong side, so I bring my yarn to the front to slip the next two stitches, bring my yarn to the back, and try not to pull too hard. You don't want to strangle those stitches that you slipped. Just a nice loose and easy tension. And then I've got five stitches left, which is great, which means I actually counted the pattern correctly. And there's row two. Okay. And then you turn your work. Now I get to bring in my contrast color. Oh, I'm going to move up my sticky notes so I know where I'm at. Sweaty hands, shake them out. And now I'm going to join my next color. So a note about changing colors. All you really need to do, you're only ever going to be changing colors every two rows. And when you join the new ball for the first time, all you need to do is start knitting with the second color and ignore the first color. What I like to do because it tends to, these stitches tend to be a little bit loose once you join that new ball. 
and I know I'm always starting, I'm going to start and end with five knit stitches because that's my nice border. So I know my first stitch is a knit stitch. I'm going to knit with that second color and bring it through. And then often I like to just tie the end, the short end of, make sure it's not your working yarn, to my first color. And just in a single knot, and all that's going to do is maintain a little bit of tension there so your stitches don't get loose. And then at the end, when I'm completely finished everything, I'm going to undo that knot and weave in the ends. You could leave it in, it's probably not going to show. But it's not a permanent knot, it's just sort of a placeholder to give a little tension to that edge stitch. That's that's not in the pattern, that's just something I like to do when I join a new ball or change a color. Oh, and make sure, always make sure you've got the yarn that's feeding from your ball and not the short end. Or you'll get a few stitches in and run out and be frustrated. Okay, dogs. so row three. I'm reading from right to left because it's a right side row. And my pattern tells me that I need one, two, three, four, five, six, or is that seven? I didn't take this together very well. Let me check, double check over here. It's seven. Seven stitches with my new color. You're just knitting them, nothing fancy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now I see a V, I know that's a slip stitch. I'm on a right side row, so I'm gonna leave my working yarn at the back because the right side is facing me, the right side of the work. I have to leave my yarn at the wrong side of the work. I'm gonna slip one, knit one, slip one, slip one. Slip one purlwise. All I'm doing is slipping, I'm not working it. I'm slipping it as if I'm gonna purl it, so my right hand needle is going from the right hand side to the left, slipping it off. So slip one, knit the next stitch, slip the next stitch, purlwise with yarn and back, slip the next stitch, purlwise with yarn and back, knit the next three stitches. It's a little tight because I've got my marker there telling me I'm on a right side row. Slip two, knit one, Slip one. Oh, nope, leave my yarn in the back. Slip two, knit one. Slip the next one. And then I should have four, five, six. I have eight stitches. Did I do this right? Uh oh. Don't fail me now. See, it's now when I've started switching colors, it's really easy to go back and see and double check your work and make sure that uh, you've got the right number of slips and knits. So I'm actually kind of glad that I'm unsure here. I get to walk through this with you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Double check on my small chart, seven. Then when I see the contrast color, I know that that's a slip stitch now. So I've got one slip stitch, one knit stitch, two slip stitches, three knit stitches, two slip stitches, one knit stitch, one slip stitch. And then maybe I've steered wrong with the number of stitches that are supposed to be on my needle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, that's right, I counted six, it's eight. Oh, I'm good. Oh, but see, I got to double check with you. Thanks for following me on that journey. <laughs> Good, so I've got the right number of stitches. And we learned a little bit about backtracking, <laughs> which is always good, because learning how to do something is great, but if you don't know how to fix your mistakes, you're gonna get stuck and you're gonna get frustrated. So you can see now, I've got two different colors happening, but I only knit with one color in that row. That's what makes mosaic knitting so easy. And now that we've established that color change, 
your wrong side rows are going to be a total cinch because now when I see the color change, I know that I'm going to knit with my aqua yarn. And when I see the pink, I slip it. So you don't have to count on your second rows, which is awesome. You don't have to count. You don't have to look at the chart. You can watch Netflix. It's fantastic. If your family members interrupt your counting, you don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to speed through this row. And I'm just going to mention again that when we're on the wrong side row and you slip a stitch, you have to bring your working yarn to the front because the front is now the, the, the wrong side of your work. And I'm going to slip that stitch as if to purl, bring the yarn back because the yarn has to be in the back for a knit stitch. Knit my next one. Now I see, hey, that's a pink one. The contrast color are the ones that I slip. Slip, oh, don't slip it right off your needle. Bring my yarn to the back. Knit the aqua ones. So it takes a couple rows for things to really establish. But once you've got your pattern established, it makes the chart easier to follow after a couple rows because you can see what's what. And yeah, you don't have to follow on those second rows. So then that essentially turns our, what is it, 44 row chart into a 22 row chart. And I should mention actually, while there are standards that I talked about, about um, charts where one square equals one stitch and you always read from bottom to top, etc., there are some inconsistencies with how mosaic charts are, um, are drawn. Because you'll see in this book I referenced before, which is the Mosaic Knitting by Barbara Walker, if you're interested in looking at other mosaic patterns, her charts each line of the chart represents two rows. So sometimes you'll see this. Um, I think some people like to do it this way because it gives a more accurate um, visual of what the, the pattern will look like when it's knit. You can see that this is kind of this squiggly, um, I don't know what to call it. It's not a Greek key, but something similar. Um, you can see what the pattern's gonna look like when it's knit. Whereas this pattern, you can kind of see the heart in there, but it's elongated. And that's because garter stitch is a very short stitch and it's not proportionately um, the same as our squares on our grid. They would really be like long rectangles and then you would get uh, a proportionate view. So that's just, and it's just an aside, informational note. So I'll keep moving on. What did I do? I did row three, I did row four, and now I'm gonna switch colors again. So now that I tied on my second color, I just ignore that one, and I start knitting with my pink again. You just drop it and pick up the other one. You don't cut in between your uh, color changes, because then you'd have to weave in all those ends, and when you're carrying it up like this pink, once I bring it up here, it's only being drawn up the side of the work for uh, like a quarter of an inch, not even. So it's really not going to be visible, especially with garter stitch. You can see, oh, I guess I'm this way. I don't know if you can see that. This is my edge where I've carried the yarn across. It's really, it's almost invisible. It doesn't look remarkably different than the other side. So it's really not worth cutting every couple rows and weaving in those ends. And then you'd have a big bulky edge with all these woven in ends. So for row five, I'm picking up the peach colored yarn again, which is the gray squares. Oh, and I don't know if you can see this over here. I, I wound this into a cake because I had uh, some little leftovers. You do not need to do this. You can knit directly from Burnett Baby Cakes balls. 
I know sometimes beginners get very confused about whether they need to wind things into bolts. Like, no, we did it for you. You can knit right from there. But sometimes when you've used a ball for eight different purposes, <laughs> they start not looking like balls anymore. And so that's why I did that. So I won't have to fight with tangles while I'm knitting for you guys. Okay, my fifth row. And one, two, three, four, five, which is really just my border. So I'm going to knit with my new color and just ignore the other one. I've come to a V. I know that that is a slip stitch. So I'm on the right side row. My yarn is being held to the wrong side of the work, which is at the back, because the right side is facing me. Slip the next stitch purlwise. And then I'm going to knit one, two, three, four, five, six. This is where the pattern starts to change. You do need to pay attention because sometimes you'll be knitting your previously knit stitches and sometimes you'll be knitting your previously slipped stitches. So make sure you pay attention. Double count things when you're working your right side rows. So I've got my six knit stitches. I'm going to slip the next one. Then I've got one, two, three, four, five, six more. I love the sound of these needles when they click. <laughs> um, oh, we had a question here from Barbara asking yeah. if other types of patterns come with charts. Oh, lots, lots and lots and lots. That's usually, um, you know, decision by the designer or the, the yarn company. Um, I know at Yarnspirations, we try to provide charts as much as possible and Anytime we do provide a chart, we're also providing the written words. Um, so it really depends on the company, depends on the designer. Um, I think for, for certain techniques for color work, you're usually going to find a chart for lace knitting, for cables, for fair isle. Um, it's just much easier to follow a chart, at least, at least with me. I know some people do prefer seeing, you know, K5, slip one P, W, Y, I, B. <laughs> I can't even say it off the top of my head. I really prefer the, the visual, but absolutely. Like uh, I, I think charts are a really great tool and they're applicable to all different kinds of techniques, not just this mosaic knitting. And you know, there's a lot of similarities here um, that you'll see in different types of charts. Okay, so I just did, what did I do? I did row five, and now we're coming back on the wrong side row, which is row six. All the even numbers are wrong side rows. And as I mentioned before, sorry, I'm a little tangled. You don't have to count. You don't even really need to look at the chart. You just need to recognize the colors. So I know on this row, on my wrong side rows, I'm gonna knit all of the peach colored um, stitches and I'm going to slip the aqua colored stitches. And the only difference is whether you're holding your yarn at the front of the work or the back of the work, which is the right side or the wrong side, um, when you slip. So I'm on a wrong side row. I'm going to knit all of these peach colored stitches. And then I've come to an aqua one. I know I have to slip it. I'm on the wrong side row because my marker is not facing me. So it's, this is the wrong side. My working yarn should be at the wrong side to slip that stitch. But my next stitch is a knit and uh, knit stitches, you need your yarn at the right side of the work, or sorry, the back of the work. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's the right, uh, right side facing or wrong side facing, your yarn is always in the back when you're knitting. I'd love to know if anyone has tried this technique before. Let me know that in the chat. Or if you've tried other types of color work and found them frustrating. I think this is a lesser known technique, this mosaic technique. Um, but it has been gaining some popularity, especially in crochet, because this is a technique that, unlike a lot of others, um, 
it has a has a, a almost exactly the same technique in crochet. Of course, it's worked a little differently, but um, but it, the results are are pretty much the same. Where you're just using uh, one one color at a time, and in crochet, it's you're not slipping; you're actually skipping the stitch. But let's that's for another class. That's for the mosaic crochet. All right, so you can kind of see the pattern is just starting to form a little bit. And so it's pretty cool that with just skipping that stitch, just with slipping it and not knitting it, now it's sitting in front of those peach colored strands. And, um, and it looks like you've been knitting in two colors when you're just using one. It's kind of a trick. I think so. Julia, just to confirm, um, so when you're on the wrong side of the work, you slip with the yarn in front. Yes. Perfect. Um, I, I hope I haven't been confusing people because I know I'm referencing the right side of the work and the wrong side of the work. And then also, um, you know, what's, what's uh, front and back. Front and back, right side, wrong side. Um, you know, I think the great thing is that if somebody's confused, certainly I definitely would probably rewatch this many. I rewatch videos many times before I start going. <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying to explain things a couple different ways because I know everybody learns a little bit differently. You know, sometimes just a word will slip people up, right? Like slipping a stitch, like maybe they want to say, oh, you just loop it, or, you know, everyone's got their terminology that is appealing for them, and that worked for them. Christy said that this has been really helpful. Um, she's never really had somebody try and teach, and she hasn't been confused at all. Oh, great. I, I should have more confidence, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I guess, oh, we're getting close to the end, aren't we? So maybe I should just review or see if we have any more questions. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Um, so if anybody has any other questions here about you know, this technique or the pattern, just let us know and we can cover them before the, the class is over today. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can, you can see once you've got a few more rows going, it's pretty easy to tell uh, whether you're on the right side or the wrong side of the work. Clearly, as I've been explaining, that's one of the more important things that you have to keep in mind as you're working this mosaic stitch. You really have to be able to tell if you're on a right side row or wrong side row. Um, a recap. Okay, so get your pattern from um, the chat. We were looking at, this is called the Party Party Mosaic Knit Baby Blanket. And I did mention that this uh, technique also exists in crochet. And uh, there is actually a crochet version of this blanket. It's a little bit different. Um, but if you know somebody who crochets and they're like, oh, I wish I could knit and I could make that blanket, say, hey, you can make one too. Um, what else do I want to mention? I want to put a shout out to my coworker, Erin Black, who actually designed this, I actually didn't design this blanket. I knit, I, I designed the crochet version of this blanket <laughs> and she did the knit version. So shout out to her, she did a great job. Um, there's just a question here, is knitting one color per row typical of mosaic knitting and using slip stitches? Is that traditionally kind of how mosaic is made up? It is absolutely 100% what this technique is all about. It's always that way. It's always knit two rows with one color, knit two rows with the next color, every single pattern in mosaic knitting. Um, and it's uh, the slip stitch is always the same. Um, the only thing that differs is you can also, like this is garter stitch slips, um, garter stitch mosaic. You can also um, work this technique in stocking stitch. So then you'd be working some pearls as well as the knits and you would have sort of a smoother side and then the wrong side would be like the pearl side. So it would be um, 
yeah, be, be smoother rather than this bumpy, squishy fabric that garter stitch gives you. Awesome. Um, and there's just a question here on what needles are you using? Uh, the size, the brand, all of the above. Um, I'm using the uh, uh, US 7 4.5 millimeter circular needles. Um, I like metal needles. I think these are Addy, Addy needles, Stasol Addy needles. I know that, um, uh, is it Boy makes some great ones? I mean, it, I like metal needles because the, the stitches slide really well especially when you're dealing with a, a cord, but, um, but yeah, that's what I'm using. You might want bamboo. Some people, if you find you knit loose and you are dropping stitches off your needle a lot, um, bamboo is really great because they'll grip the stitch a little bit more. It's all personal preference, right? These are my faves for sure. Awesome. And um, there's just one other question here from Gina. Is there a way to make your edge look neater? You insulting my edge. <laughs> <laughs> they might be, I know I have a huge problem. My edges, no matter what I do, they just, they always look so bad. I know, it, it's, it's tension, it's like, it's personal tension. It's uh, how loosely you're carrying your yarn up the side. Like there's so many factors. And I will say that Brunette, um baby velvet and any chenille yarn really this is it's called a chenille yarn this kind of fuzzy texture it doesn't have a lot of stretch so it's not very forgiving if your tension isn't perfect so yeah if it, it can be a little tricky to keep edges neat um you can try blocking your um your finished project that helps a lot so there's a couple different ways to do that you can um, lay out your piece. If it's a blanket, it gets tricky because it, it can be big. And pin it to a surface, like an ironing board. Um, I have these like cork tiles that, um, I don't even know what they're for. I guess they're for making your own bulletin board. You could use a bulletin board for sure. Anything you can put pins into. And then you can take uh, an iron, be very, very careful and just use the steam setting, or if you have a steamer and hold it several inches above your work and give it a steam and kind of tug it into place and then let it dry, let it cool down. And it should, some, um, some fibers block better than others, um, but most of them will respond to steam or uh, water and neaten up a little bit. Um, the other thing you can do is soak your project for not long, just enough that the fiber really gets saturated, like five minutes or something. And then very carefully squeeze out as much water as you can and lay it somewhere flat to dry. And as you know, when it's wet and it's a little more malleable, you can kind of pull the edges, get them really neat, and hopefully it won't shrink back. Like I said, some fibers are more um, easier to block than others. Um, but it should help a little bit in um, neatening up those edges. And really it's just practice and keeping your tension as even as possible to keep those edges neat. I hope that helped. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Julia. We <clears throat> over here at Michaels want to say thank you for taking the time today to walk us through this project. I know it sounds like everybody really enjoyed watching you and learning and, and this is such a fun project to play around with. Um, so thanks for taking time today to walk us through. For everyone that joined the class today, just a reminder, um, this video will be fully available online tomorrow. We're gonna put the link in the chat now. Um, but please do join us for any of our upcoming classes. We are doing knitting, crochet, baking, uh, resin pour, jewelry making, you name it. We're doing free classes for you guys online. Um, you can sign up at that link as well. And um, we are building our schedule out far in advance. I know someone asked when these classes will end. We do not have an end date because we know you guys are loving it so much. So thank you guys so much for joining us. We will let everyone get back to enjoying their day. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye, Thanks everybody. everybody.